It was the darling new nation, born from the ravages of occupation. East Timor had become the world's newest country after a quarter of a century of resistance to Indonesia. But six years after independence, it remains a volatile place, propped up by thousands of visiting foreigners and their false economy. In Dili, there are traffic snarls of United Nations vehicles. Police from 39 nations flood the streets. Dozens of aid agencies clamour to do good. But despite all the goodwill in the world, this is not the new nation most of these people had hoped for. The level of suspicion and distrust on these streets is extraordinary. It's hard to be happy in your homeland when you don't have a home. This is what's become of the new democracy. One-tenth of the total population of one million has been chased out of house and home by their own countrymen. This is the story of the part played by a new generation of East Timorese youth. And how rather than building their nation, they seem hell-bent on destroying the country their fathers created. After eight years abroad in Portugal and Australia, Alex de Souza is home and with mates again. His passion is Salat, a martial arts introduced here during Indonesian times. I came to East Timor and I seen a different kind of martial arts and um, I went to assist one of the, uh, the trainings and I liked it. Um, PSHD is P. Alex is one of 30,000 East Timorese devotees of PSHT, an organisation that binds its members beyond sporting ties. The heart means the brotherhood is coming from our hearts. That's, that's what the heart means. <laughs> Far from symbolism, PSHT has been at war. It's one of a number of groups involved in an ongoing battle for recruits, land and influence in this fledgling country. <laughs> if you kill one of them, you'll get revenge. That's for sure. That's a Timorese way to um, solve the problems. This is fertile recruiting ground for the gangs. There's not much to do here. Almost half of young people don't have a job and the UN and aid agencies provide about the only work anyway. It's hardly surprising that seven out of ten young men find their way to the various clubs and gangs. It's above family ties. Um, so, you know, they'll kill for, for their brothers. Josa Luis Sousa Santos has also returned from abroad to help rebuild his country. The one-time intelligence advisor to the Australian Defence Force has worked with his Prime Minister and also the United Nations on the gang problem. If political parties require um, support um, in regards to demonstrations or uh, in regards to defending themselves or attacking um, enemies, they utilise the, the martial art groups. <laughs> Out of all the groups in Timor-Leste, that probably would be the most influential group politically at a high level, PSHT. I've come to meet the next generation of PSHT members. It could be any youth club, but these young people have joined an organisation which infiltrates the police and army, the public service and high echelons of government. Intimidation, burning of houses, violent attacks on individuals, 
Sam. Having such a large number of PSHT masters inside the police force and in the police special groups means they've got access to, um, you know, to, to weapons and to uh, ammunition where most of, the, most of the population don't. To find out how these gangs operate and what they do, you need only to go back to the violence of 2006. 6,000 homes were destroyed when those who saw themselves as Westerners of East Timor tried to remove those who regarded themselves as Easterners. The gangs played a central role as enforcers. It was a mad scramble to stake a claim, a demonstration that owning a house in East Timor can be a very tenuous proposition. Neighbours can simply burn each other out here. Nothing much can be done about it. That's because the land tenure situation is a mess. There's traditional title, title from Portuguese times, from Indonesian occupation. But in the end, once you get a place, you just hang on to it. This is what became of Delhi's so-called Easterners. They live in tents, one third of the city's population surviving on handouts the government can't afford. The displacement camps spill into hospitals, into the sanctuary of church grounds, and even into Dilly's fire station. What we are doing here is to create, if you like, a nation of beggars. And we need to get away from, from this dependency on handouts uh, and move to back to a situation where people can actually fend for themselves. For almost two years, this single tent has been home to a Stanislaw Soares, his wife and their seven children. Their home was destroyed as Westerners moved in. Now a cut in the rice handout is about to make life even more difficult. Tamba. Most people don't have the means to return to their homes and they have genuine fears about what will happen if they try to go back. Eric, A Stanislaw agreed to leave camp to show me his old home just a few kilometres up the road. He had three houses here and only one still stands. The new occupier he recognises. This man's son was the one who attacked a Stanislaw and destroyed his houses. But like every other land dispute here, nothing is clear cut. It turns out that Stanislaw himself had taken over the house years before when its occupants fled unrest in 1999. Both men had been squatters at some stage in this house. Neither have any paperwork to prove ownership anyway. It seems to have been an affable meeting, but as Stanislaw leaves with a threat ringing in his ear. He's been told it will be the youth of the street who will sort this one out. Our guide to the gangs, Jose Luis Sousa Santos, says he knows what this means. When he tries to go back to claim his house, you know, there could be a violent reaction from the youth. You'll know, either get burnt out again or they'll kill him. Gang members, they will back each other up almost to the death. Other cells will come into it. You know, within uh, 24 hours, you know, it's turned into uh, a street battle of 1,500 people. So fragile is the peace here that even unrealistic fears can ignite a new spiral of violence. East Timor has democracy, but the very prospect of elections can send people packing. After last year's poll, the gangs were at it on the streets again.
This time, it was the so-called Westerners who fled to safety outside of Dili. Jose Dos Santos and his family of eight were among them. He's never had a paying job in his life, he says, and he's not going to get one rotting away here. The gangs aren't just on the outside, they prosper within the refugee camps. When the government halved rice rations, gang leaders protested and against the wishes of most tent dwellers, they refused to allow any food in at all. If martial arts groups, it would just be martial arts groups that will do their sports and practice their martial arts, I don't think there would be any problem. In fact, it would be very, very constructive. And therein lies perhaps the challenge of helping to move these groups into channel their energies into something constructive rather than, than, than engaging in, in, in warfare amongst themselves. The rules of Kiss of First and Mort Sober Manir Sagrar Purnos. Old Rica Campos prays to the Virgin Mary, but he also worships the dead and believes he has the power to deflect bullets. He's a member of the ritualistic 7-7 gang, a clandestine group that once supported the Falantil fighters who fought Indonesia. This is a sign, the seven points. There are 12,000 followers who each bear the seven scars. Old Rico wears a crocodile tooth for divine protection and this armband. This can protect us from the black magic. So the black magic cannot harm you. What do you mean by that? Are I dug deeper and Old Rico Campos told me more about the black magic gangs and some more sinister practices. There is the people who like eat the, the meat from the human, human meats. So really that happens in <laughs> yeah, yeah. In here we have that. <laughs> they, they have another mission, different way to think. The current incarnation of 7-7 is a corruption of East Timorese culture. The usage of almost voodoo rituals is troubling because a lot of these kids do believe you know, that once they've joined 7-7 their life force is now tied to the group. So that whenever the, you know, the, the, their master decides to, to cut them loose, uh, that they'll die. So it's a very good way to keep control over unruly kids. Fixing ropes and holes is not hard. There are those in East Timor determined to stay straight and contribute something positive to their new country. Yeah, they're poor, so they can't afford a good helmet. Like others in our story, Fabio Diasis spent time abroad during the turbulent years before nationhood. Fabio escaped the gangs of Los Angeles. Now he's trying to stay clear of them here. I just saw a bunch of people sitting around doing nothing with all this work to be done. So Fabio got to work quickly. That was my first job, the Cuban embassy. I did all the fence work and the welding. The Cuban ambassador had felt that um, there was a security risk and so we did a security assessment and did an upgrade for him. That one right there with the red flower, mm. That was pretty easy to do, so I think we'll probably get some more. Fabio has now launched a nursery and landscaping business with his father and set for himself a business plan for the years to come. Um, I want to get these going here because the colors, because we've got the, the purple, the yellow, the peach. I feel like I have a great idea today, but, you know, is that idea going to be destroyed tomorrow by some group or gang or whatever? Unless it all breaks down again, I don't see myself leaving. I see myself staying here and in, in, in building a future, a bigger, better future for myself. But for those disaffected and disenchanted, it's the gangs that offer meaning in life. It's hardly encouraging for the nation builders of East Timor, 
but the 7-7 gang is at war with PSHT. The organisation followed by young Alex de Souza. While he says he doesn't involve himself in trouble, he knows what his fellow members are capable of. The way I see, it's never going to finish. For sure, as soon as one of them knows the other is from the different, um, is from PSHT or 7-7, everyone's going to get involved. A country torn by politics, family feuds and an east-west rivalry is also racked with gang warfare. The despair of East Timorese is felt most by the real victims of this chaos, the tent dwellers who have become refugees in their own city. Clearly the Timorese people are traumatised. They've gone through 24 years of brutal oppression with hundreds of thousands of people killed. They've gone through a very traumatic transition. Their fathers were heroes, resistance fighters who banded together to help win nationhood. The youth of East Timor today are searching for purpose. A lot of these kids didn't have a chance to contribute to the independence fight, or the war for independence. So maybe they'd see this as a chance to prove themselves as warriors, prove themselves as uh, leaders, as brave. And the best way of doing it is, well, you, you, you have an enemy. For all the goodwill and hundreds of millions of dollars of international aid, Almost half of East Timorese live on less than one dollar a day. The tiny new democracy that was promised so much languishes as the poorest nation in the Asia-Pacific region. No thanks to thousands of its young people content to destroy